Uh, well, uh, welcome to the YouTube channel and uh, this lecture. I'm coming to you from my studio here in fabulous Las Vegas. We are explicating the Series 7 content outline. So we uh, did critical function one. You know, this has a chronological sequence that Finner expects uh, brokers to be able to do. So we did critical function one, nine questions where as a baby broker, that's a term of endearment. That's not a derogatory term. That's just a, you know, somebody who's new. And the first thing baby brokers do is try and go out and find a business for their broker dealer, find customers and look at prospects, potential customers. And we did that explication. Uh, that was uh, critical function one, nine questions. So today we're moving on to critical function two, uh, that we open accounts and obtain and evaluate customers' financial profile and their investment objectives, which is 11 questions. And that will set us up for critical function three, which is the huge part, right? 91 questions on investment vehicles. We'll probably break that up and do, you know, several um, uh, lectures, but we'll try and get this one done in one fell swoop. And so we're in critical function uh, two. So let's go to critical function two. We did critical function one already. Now we're doing our second explication. I wasn't sure if people would find this useful or not, but uh, I did have some candidates on the channel and elsewhere tell me they did find it useful and with that uh, feedback, we'll go ahead and we'll continue on with the explication. So, you know, again, this isn't, we're not lecturing. So I want you to be clear about what is being done. We're trying to help you with what I would call an intellectual inventory of what at the end of the day you need to do. We have entire lectures on some of this stuff, hour, two hours on some of this stuff. So critical function two is opening accounts after obtaining and evaluating customers' financial profile and their investment objectives. We talk to the customer about various types of accounts we have and, uh, you know, the restrictions in certain types of accounts. And the uh, first one we've got here, so let's uh, get a different color for our explication, is we have uh, pattern day traders, and that's for people who do four or more trades in a five-day period. And they are going to be... Uh, pattern day traders. And then what they're going to have to come up with is a 25 grand in terms of their equity for that account. And they're going to give them a disclosure document that tells them that uh, that's how it is their financial health. We have prime brokers, prime brokers. I haven't had anybody see, tell me they've seen a question on prime brokers on either SIE or on uh, series seven top off, but prime brokers provide execution and custody, or excuse me, uh, custody and financing for hedge funds, institutional uh, investors. No, I don't want to get a whole bunch of different statements. I want to get one statement. And then delivery versus payment or receipt versus a payment. You know, these are typically, again, institutional accounts. And this is where the uh, institutional investor says, Dean, I don't need your broker dealer to hold my monies and securities. When I buy uh, securities, deliver the securities to my bank, State Street Bank and Trust, and they will cut you a check. Now, the test question is that I have up to 35 calendar days to get that done. Now in the real world, it's not gonna take me 35 calendar days to get paid. Because you know, if I wanna get paid, I'm gonna deliver that typically, I'm gonna be able to do this a lot quicker. But I have up to 35 calendar days to uh, make delivery of that. You have to be able to contrast on your exam. So let me get some of this up. You have to be able to contrast joint tenants with rights or survivorship. That was made a different color again. You have to be able to contrast joint tenants with rights or survivorship with a joint tenants in common on your exam. And the big test is what happens to the decedent, the dead person's share of the account. You know, in a joint tenants with rights or survivorship account, the decedent share goes to the surviving party. In tenants in common, the decedent share goes to their estate or beneficiary. So in joint tenants with rights or survivorship, surviving party, tenants in common. Uh, you know, I'm not gonna hold myself to, to uh, surviving, looks like any other V there. Survivor, surviving party, Sur surviving. Uh, I'm not gonna do that and worry about the math, uh, spelling too much. Anyways, with uh, tenants in common, 
the decedent share. Goes to a state or beneficiary. Uh, requirements for opening the customer account. Well, we, you know, we have a new account form, and we got to get the new account form filled out. You know, uh, the obvious things I need is a picture ID. I need you to be able to prove you are who you, clear, you claim you are. Again, I got to meet a different color. So the trick here on the test is a birth certificate doesn't work because you know that doesn't prove that you are who you claim to be. So I need a picture ID. I need a physical address. People do not live in PO boxes, so I need to know. Now, after I get the account open, I'm more than happy to send things to a PO box, but I need a physical address. And then I'm gonna need my principal to approve the account. All right, so picture ID, physical address. Uh, I need to know, do you work at a broker dealer? And because if so, I'm gonna make written notice to them telling them you're attempting to open an account a year. And I'm gonna follow any instructions they give me. Or does your immediate family member work at another broker dealer? Uh, retirement plans, uh, transfers, and rollovers. You know, we don't really care too much on the test about a, a transfer from custodian a, B to custodian B, uh, a, uh, B, A to B, but we do care on the exam uh, about a rollover. You take physical possession, you need to have that rollover done in 60 days. So, you know, I say, hey, listen, I'll be next Tuesday down there. I want you to liquidate all my investments. I want a cashier's check. Then I have 60 days to put that back in the appropriate spot. So we care about rollovers. Eligibility, we have to tell employees how they become eligible to participate in the pension plan. You know, uh, usually that would be 21 years of age and a thousand hours, but whatever the case is, you know, it doesn't do you any good to have a retirement plan you don't know anything about and you don't know how you become eligible. You know, we're either gonna have a qualified plan or non-qualified plan. So here it says uh, distribution strategies. You know, we're either gonna be getting everything that was taxable Qualified means you've met the uh, qualifications of the Department of Labor and the IRS. But the key point about qualified is you have a zero uh, cost base. That means everything coming out is taxable. And then uh, non-qualified means you're uh, funding it with after-tax money. And so you mean you're going to have a cost base and you owe taxes on the difference. Uh, defined benefit, very important. So we, the two basic types of employee sponsor plans are defined benefit and defined contribution. And uh, defined benefit the employer assumes the investment risk. And in defined contribution, the employee assumes the investment risk. You know, for example, your 401k, for example, will be defined contribution. Here, your employer defines what they're going to contribute, maybe match you on your first 3%, whatever the case may be. You invest it, whatever it grows to or falls to, uh, that's what you end up getting. You know, very hard for your employer to end up with an unfunded pension plan in that kind of a scenario. Uh, types of defined contributions, uh, 457s are deferred comp, where you take your after-tax money, you invest it, and hopefully it grows too, but you have a cost base because you're doing it after tax. Uh, defined benefit, we talked about profit sharing is a type of defined contribution, no profits, no sharing. Uh, some employers give you stock options or will purchase stock for you. And remember, whenever you hear non-qualified deferred compensation, it just means you're out using after-tax money. Uh, wealth. So with the, uh, there's wealth events inheritance, there's a step up in your basis. So what the IRS assumes, ha whoop, let me get a different color again. Uh, we've been using red. Let's do use purple. Let's do a purple one. There's a uh, step up in your basis. So the IRS assumes that if I die today, I just transferred those assets to my heirs. Now that's not a problem for my heirs, but it could be a problem for my, uh, my estate. Cause you know, the, Maybe I don't have enough liquidity. Maybe I haven't got an insurance policy. I haven't got what I need to take care of this. So there's going to be a step up in the basis. And it's market value of death is the step up. 
uh, account registrations uh, and changes in internal transfers all have to be documented. So, you know, if you say, hey, Dean, uh, take my wife off the account or wife takes, takes my husband account off the account, I go, no, no, no. I need to have proper documentation of that. And, you know, so later on, I mean, right now, right? I mean, this is going on with Bill and Melinda Gates. If Bill is taking Melinda's name off things, we, it's not the problem, by the way. I think they transferred $2 billion worth of stock to her. But we want to make sure everything's hunky-dory in terms of the documentation on that. Documentation. By the way, that's the same if it's going internally. It doesn't matter. You make sure that's uh, all copacetic. All right. So we uh, obtain, obtain and update customer information and documentation, including legal documents, and identify and escalate for uh, suspicious activity. So we talked a little bit already about the customer identification program. That was the picture ID. I say, listen, for me to know, uh, do a good job for you over time, I need to know a lot about you. And you say, well, Dean, it's none of your damn business. I go, well, no, it is. My regulators say that I have an obligation to know my customers so that I can make suitable recommendation. More importantly, I don't make unsuitable recommendations. So the more I know about you, the better I'm gonna be in determining suitability. So I need to know whether my customer is a citizen or a foreign resident. I mean, I'll do business with foreign residents. Uh, I need to whether a corporate insider. All kinds of rules apply to insiders. Insiders, anyone who can influence the decisions of a corporation. Uh, sometimes, whoop, I need a different color here. Sorry about that. Anyone who can influence the decisions of a corporation and their immediate family members. And there's all kinds of rules for those people. Those are people who are also known as control persons. So let's just go back there. Also known as control persons. And all the stock they own is called control stock. And uh, who are those people? Those would be officers, directors, and principal stockholders. You know, for example, uh, Larry Ellison owns 25% of Oracle. He's an officer, he's a director, and he's a principal stockholder. If anybody was ever a control person, it's him. There's all kinds of rules about how much stock he can sell, you know, coming up in different stuff, 144. You got to do short sales. So that's really important that we know whether you're one of these folks or not. Principal stockholders, 10% or more. You know, by the way, his immediate family member, his daughter's Meg Ellison, these rules apply to her. Right, so the immediate family. Uh, employees of the broker dealer, we talked about that one already. We said, if you're an employee of a broker dealer, you're opening an account at a different broker dealer. I say, I'm gonna make written notice to your employing broker dealer, that you're opening an account here and I'm gonna follow any instructions they give me in terms of duplicate confirms and statements. Information security and privacy regulations. Uh, you know, Reg SP says, I have to you know, make sure that I'm uh, you know, protecting your customer information. If I want to cross solicit, so I want to, you know, I know I have this information about you and I want to use it to try and sell you other things, you know, mortgages or insurance or whatever the case is, uh, I need your permission to do it. I got to make it easy for you to opt out. I can't make, you know, make it difficult for you to say, Dean, don't bother me. Opt out means you're saying you don't want to be cross solicited. So, you know, you say, Dean, leave me alone. I hit a button and I don't hear about the bank's mortgage or the insurance company's, you know, variable stuff. That, no. Now, the exception to that, the exception is if it's the government. So the U.S. government, the Department of Treasury or the IRS wants to know about you, then I'm going to disclose whatever it is they want to know. I'll put legal requests. This just isn't, you know, somebody who calls you. It's a, you know, a legal request.
Um, hey, let's see. Uh, power of attorneys, account authorization. So very testable. Again, we have two types of uh, power of attorney. By the way, uh, power of his attorneys are also known as trading authorization. They allow other people to make investment decisions for you. And so power of attorney, we have two. We have limited power of attorney, where all I can do is make decisions about action, asset, or amount. Action is whether to buy or sell. Asset is which security to buy or sell. And the amount is the quantity, three A's. And then full power of attorney means I can also withdraw monies and securities. And so obviously that one is uh, you know a bigger supervisory challenge. Uh, if we're gonna have a trust account. We need a copy of the trust agreement. You know, make sure you know what they're allowed to do, what they're not allowed to do is the trustee, right? If we're gonna open an account for a corporation, we need a copy of the corporate resolution saying which officer it is that's gonna be allowed to engage or make investments on behalf of the corporation. So we need a copy of the corporate resolution. Uh, by the way, if they wanna borrow money to purchase securities, uh, we need a copy of the corporate charter for margin and it's gotta be specifically permitted uh, within that document. Uh, we talked about trading authority and then you, uh, we talked about the uh, documents. You're gonna have to have this uh, signed. Uh, by the way, you, you have to have it signed prior to the first trade. So let's just put that in there. Yeah, maybe I should put it here. First trade after. You don't do the trade before you get it first trade after principal approval. Uh, let's see what else is in the explication. So there we go. Okay. Uh, 2.3, make reasonable efforts to uh, not limit it to the customer's other securities holding. Uh, one good way to find out about you is to ask what you already have in terms of investments. So what do you have? Uh, what are you holding now? What's been your most favorite, least favorite? What's your current financial situation in your tax status investment objective? So essential facts about the customer in terms of establishing the relationship. Uh, we want to do a balance sheet on the customer. So here I want to be able to do a personal balance sheet. So the balance sheet is testable at uh, two levels on the test, both the corporate and for our prospective client. A balance sheet is a, a picture in time, right? And so what I want to do is go over my customer's current liabilities, well, what I start with the asset side, current and long-term. You know, current would be cash or things you plan to turn to cash within the next 12 months. Long-term would be like your house, your car, you know, your retirement funds, things you aren't planning on doing that. And then uh, I'll uh, go through the liabilities, both again, current and long-term current are things you plan on paying within the next 12 months. And long-term, that'd be like the mortgage on the house. And what I'm trying to establish at this picture in time is your net worth. Because you know, what I'm hoping is that I can, as working with the customer, uh, help you get that net worth up. You know, I would also, I would also wanna know uh, other things about you, like your income. So I probably wanna do an income statement as well. You know, because what I'm looking for is can I find some money perhaps to redeploy into dollar cost averaging? So what's your annual income? Remember the one there I'm interested in is the 200K or 300K. So, you know, if you have that for the last two years, expectation of that this year, I can invite you to a Reg D or do you have a net worth of a million dollars exclusive of your personal property, your primary residence. So I can invite you to, again, a private placement. So that accredited investor, uh, you wanna find that out when you open the account to see whether we can invite them to uh, some Reg Ds, right? Uh, what is their investment experience? Are they sophisticated, unsophisticated? Are they getting employee stock options from their employer? That could add up. Uh, what kind of insurance do they need? You know, in terms of uh, replacing any, uh, you know, income they may lose as a result of disability or perhaps death, what are the liquidities? 
And then we're going to want to get some investment objectives, you know, uh, safety, preservation of capital, income, growth, speculation. And then remember, the whole biggest part of your exam is critical function three. The things we don't do for somebody who says they need preservation of capital. We don't uh, buy them a call contract, for example. We don't put them in oil and gas exploratory program, for example. You know, what do we have for income? Dividend paying stocks. We have uh, preferred stock. We have bonds, right? You know, uh, growth, we have growth stocks, you know, where we're uh, going to price appreciation. If they want to speculate, well, God bless them. We have options for them, right? Uh, we have reasonable basis or should have a reasonable basis for thinking our recommendations are suitable. Uh, that could be unique to the customer or based on quantitative uh, stuff, math, algorithms that tell us this is uh, probably not okay. Investment strategies and recommendations in terms of buying and holding or trading. And then we talked about verification of whether you're accredited or not and your sophistication level. Uh, required review, we said you need to always have a principal approval for the account. Uh, physical receipts, uh, that's handled by the cashiering department. And you know they like to ask you who's in charge of what. Sometimes we refer to this as the cage. You know, because we want brokers, there's a reason for a broker to be in that area of the broker uh, broker term. That's where we take receipt of uh, monies and securities. So here, physical receipt delivery and safeguarding of cash and cash equivalents, both checks and securities, that's the cashiering department of the cage that does that. And then we have circumstances for refusing are restricting activities and accounts. So for example, if you can't prove you who you are under the uh, you know Patriot Act we talked about, we have to have procedures for closing accounts. Uh, a lot of firms call that the WSPs, the written supervisory procedures. So, you know, how do we, you know, what are our procedures for closing these accounts? Uh, I thought, let me do a different color. Let's try a different one more time and I'll give up. There we go. The WSPs are the uh, written supervisory procedures of the brokerage firm. And we need to have procedures for closing accounts if we can't verify identity. Uh, remember, we can also have for seniors, we can uh, freeze or, you know, uh, stop a wire, for example, and uh, contact for a senior. A senior is somebody 65 or older. And in the WSPs, we're going to have what we do to protect seniors. And one thing we uh, want from them is a trusted contact person who, you know, we can call and say, hey, listen, we didn't actually wire this money. We wanted to talk to you. You know, they're trying to wire it to some prints or something, you know. Uh, well, I can restrict that or, you know, at least hold it for a little bit until we contact their trusted contact person, whoever that may be. Woohoo! Wow. So we have explicated uh, critical function two. So let's just go back to where, where we're at in this journey. Now, remember, we have a complete lectures on all these subjects. So you know, at the front of the uh, the playlist, we have the FINRA uh, outline, which is this part that we just started with here. You know, this is the front of every playlist. You know, so uh, here we're looking at the seven playlists, just so I can show you how we organize things on the YouTube channel. So the first thing you're gonna see is this document where we have a little bit of an introduction to what you're intellectually held accountable for. And then we explicated uh, critical function one, where we're trying as a baby broker to seek business for the broker dealer, its customers and find customers for the broker dealer. Then as a baby broker, the next process, again, term of endearment is we're gonna try and open accounts. New accounts are really important. I mean, a lot of firms, you don't open X number of accounts. By the way, I understand a lot of you are not working in this environment. I get it, you're working at somewhere else. But for the test, the test functions, critical functions are based on, you're going to work at you know UBS or Edward D. Jones or. Morgan Stanley or Merrill Lynch, and you're going to go prospecting. Critical function one, prospecting, you know, that's the unglorified word for that. And then once you prospect, you're going to find a customer, hopefully, right? Then you're going to open an account. That was today's discussion, 11 questions. Now, when I do the next critical function, 
Uh, again, that's huge. That's all the various investment vehicles, stocks, bonds, options, mutual funds, partnerships, uh, REITs, right? So that's 91 questions. And we'll probably break that up. I'm trying to keep this, you know, at 30 minutes. So I'm going pretty quick. I'm not trying to, you know, you're not going to pass by looking at explications of critical functions, but I want to give you a broad overview of what you're held accountable for. And I think there's like 23 or four hours of supporting lectures to this content outline. Right, so we have types of customer accounts. That's like an hour lecture on joint tenants and tenants in common and utmas and all that kind of stuff. So I uh, just want to warn you, there's no shortcuts involved. Now I'll break up critical function three into probably two or three uh, things because it's just a lot of stuff. And then we'll finish with critical function four. So I'm going to put this for premiere on uh, Thursday. Uh, this is Thursday 11th, 12th, the 13th. I'm going to put this for a premiere at 3 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. I'm not very good. I started my social media effort this year. So I'm still learning about how to, how to do social media. So good news, I can help you on the, the content, but I'm still, so I'm assuming I'm going to be able to do this. So I'm going to put this for a mirror at three o'clock. And this is the first time I'm going to try this. For this premiere, I'm actually going to join early and I'm going to try and run a live chat. So if you have any uh, FINRA or NASA questions, I'll be running a live chat uh, before the premiere, during the premiere and after premiere. So that's kind of a good uh, opportunity for you if you have some questions. I've been trying to think, well, how can we support the channel uh, with you know, uh, giving you an opportunity to ask questions? Uh, a lot of you put them right in the comment box on the YouTube channel, that's fine too. You're watching this and you got a question, you can put it right in there, but that might give us a little more opportunity for you to meet other folks and you know who knows. We'll see how it goes, it's all experimental. And the whole social media thing is experimental. So you know, things either work or they don't, and they don't work, well then we don't do them. This one, I wasn't sure, but as I said, people have found this helpful. And so we're gonna continue on. As long as people find it helpful, I'm more than happy to continue on. So critical function three is next. Uh, like, uh, subscribe, uh, share, tell your friends. And uh, hopefully I'll see you at the premiere at Thursday, three o'clock. I hope that's not too early for you for an adult beverage of your choice or get some popcorn, whatever you'd like. All right, I will see you later.